let's begin. Hello, everyone. My name is Josep Graubove, Associate Professor of Heritage Science in the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. This is our monthly invited lecture as part of the ISH Academy that apart from these lectures also organizes, for example, technical training courses. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I will introduce briefly our speaker, but before some practicalities, at this stage of hybrid working, I'm sure everyone is really, really familiar how this works, but I always say it at the start of, of every lecture. The main means of communication that you have with the speaker is using the Q&A function um, after the talk. This is the button that you will see at the bottom of the screen. You can write there your questions at any time during the presentation. And then when we reach the q and I will read them aloud. And I would be great, grateful if when you write your question, you also mention um, the institution you belong to, if applicable. That always helps uh, understand a little bit uh, the angle where your question is coming from. Um, this whole talk lasts for one hour and it is structured as follows. Um, Jose is going to speak for approximately 40 minutes and then we'll have um, a Q&A for the next 20 or, or for as long as we have questions until the hour. That's everything. Um, I'll introduce Jose. It's a pleasure to have you here, Jose. I'm glad we managed to organize this talk. Professor Jose uh, Torero is a professor of civil engineering and a head of the department of CG, which is Civil Env Environmental and Geomatic Engineering at University College London. He works in the field of safety, where he specializes in complex environments, um, novel architectures, critical infrastructure, aircraft and spacecraft, and also in, in what, what makes this lecture especially interesting for our series in fires in, in heritage buildings. He has participated in the investigations of most of the major fires of the last 20 years. And when I say major fires, I mean really major. That includes the, the Grenfell public inquiry, the collapse of the World Trade Center, the fires of the Glasgow School of Art, um, and Notre Dame, and, and many others as well. The Organization of American States has appointed him to the Human Rights Commission that investigated the disappearance of 43 students in Ayotzinapa in, in Mexico. We look forward to hearing about your experience in the field of heritage. O over to you, Jose. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and the opportunity to talk to you about uh, this subject matter. And I think uh, in many ways, the picture that you have in front of you says it all. Uh, there's a picture of Notre Dame um, during the fire right before the collapse of the steeple. And, uh, and it shows in many ways uh, the type of situations that we uh, would never want to have. Now, if you really think carefully, uh, we might argue that accidents can always happen, but when you're talking about of a building of the value uh, of Notre Dame, um, an accident of this magnitude and of this nature is something that we wish would never happen. So the, this presentation is, is about trying to understand uh, this type of problems and uh, recognizing uh, why these things happen and where does uh, complexity play a significant role. I think these are very complex problems and, uh, and we tend many times to underestimate that complexity. And because we underestimate that complexity, then uh, the potential of these things happening uh, increases beyond the level that we would expect them or want them uh, to, to increase. So uh, when we look at, at the roof of Notre Dame, uh, we can immediately recognize that we have a major hazard. So the bottom left picture is what is called the forest. And, uh, and basically is the roof structure that is a timber structure and old oak timber structure and uh, entirely formed uh, of, of timber and therefore representing a particular form of hazard. Now, if you look at the picture to the right, you will see uh, the lattice uh, timber structure that covered uh, the, the, the roof. And, uh, and that lattice timber structure are small elements of timber that go across from beam to beam, basically forming the cover of the roof. 
Now, the smaller the timber is, and anybody who has lit a chimney will know that you put kindling. And the reason why you put kindling is because you want smaller pieces of timber. Those burn much easier. And when they burn, uh, uh, for a while, they will ignite the larger pieces of timber, which in this case will be the beams and the columns. So having these smaller pieces of timber inevitably enhances the hazard. Now, the, the hazard is protected by these lead tiles. And these lead tiles represent the protection that we are putting to this fire hazard uh, from any external potential influence. So as you can see, then you have a timber structure on top uh, formed of multiple beams, columns, and so forth, all made out of timber uh, that create a hazard and that hazard is protected from the outside from any potential source of, of fire. And, uh, and you can see the full set of tiles in the uh, middle uh, photographs below. So that's uh, what the roof was. Now, the roof was being refurbished. And as part of that refurbishment, then you have eliminated some of the tiles uh, to look into fixing some potential damage that uh, the roof had. Now, the moment that you have taken off the protection, you have exposed the hazard. And now you have a very significant hazard that is exposed. Now, potentially, uh, that hazard could result in a fire. And if you have a fire, anybody that understands the dynamic of a fire will tell you that that fire will go out of control. Now, it will go through a period of growth that generally is quite long. And, uh, and then uh, past that period of growth, the fire will take a magnitude uh, where radiation dominates over fire spread. And then what happens is that you cannot control the progression of the fire. Fighting a fire at that stage becomes almost an impossibility. And, uh, and effectively, the eff efficiency of the fire service uh, diminishes dramatically. So in essence, you want to prevent that fire first from happening. And if you cannot prevent it from happening, then you have a very significant period you know, to actually respond. So if depending on the accounts, you will see that there was an extraordinarily long period of time between the moment the sophisticated detection system that Notre Dame had and the moment where people actually recognized that this was a fire and, uh, and alerted the fire service. Now you had a very sophisticated early detection alarm that told you almost immediately that you had an incipient fire. And then a long period of time, and I'm not talking about minutes, I'm talking about beyond an hour, uh, people were in principle investigating the existence of this fire and they didn't really contact the fire service until the fire actually had gone out of control and it became visible to everybody from the outside. So why did this happen? So you're talking, you're not talking about any building. I mean, you're talk, talking about Notre Dame. How come we uncover a major hazard and we didn't take the precautions to be able to prevent that major hazard from leading to a fire? And why, if we had an early detection system, we did not manage to create an operation process or a protocol that actually enabled us to take advantage of that early detection system to basically bring the fire service in a, at a point where they could have actually controlled the fire. And instead, we had to wait until the fire was obvious to everybody uh, before we took action. This is the real question. And this is the real misunderstanding of the complexity of the problem. And this is what tends to happen in many cases in this disastrous uh, uh, fire events that end up destroying a very significant part of our patrimony. So ask, asking ourselves the right questions uh, implies that we understand the complexity of the problem and therefore implies that we actually understand how to deal with this problem in the most effective way. Now, given the value of a building of this nature, we should have put the most sophisticated processes for prevention and we should have put the most sophisticated protocols of response that would have allow, allow us to take the most advantage of the inherent uh, 
uh, protection and benefits that uh, this particular structure actually have. And none of those things were actually in place. And the result was uh, what you saw in the picture below. So that's what this presentation is all about, is trying to highlight a little bit that complexity so you get a sense of really what is the level of expertise, competency, and knowledge that needs to be put in place if somebody is going to properly manage you know, fire safety in heritage buildings. So uh, these fires are not uncommon. And here's just a, a small, uh, set of some uh, major fires that have happened in the last 20 or so years. And, uh, and some of them are, are buildings of extraordinary value, like the Glasgow School of Art, for example, Windsor Castle. And uh, some of them are still important buildings, but not of such significant value, that, like the East Sussex uh, houses. And, uh, and some of them are are complicated in the sense that they're actually buildings with a significant value, but that because of the nature of the construction and of the heritage building resulted in unwanted consequences that ended up costing the lives of people. And this is a case of the Cameron Hotel in Scotland, where in 2017, two people died that should have never ever died in a fire. And um, uh, you know, so it was a very, very small fire that progressed way too rapidly almost disabled in the evacuation of most of the occupants of the, of the hotel and resulting in the deaths of two individuals. So in essence, we have a big problem. And this is a problem that is quite complicated, is an extraordinarily costly problem, uh, not only from the perspective of money, but also from the perspective of the loss of cultural heritage. So uh, why is this problem in many ways so difficult to manage? And I think it, this is the first question that we really need to ask ourselves. Why is it so difficult to manage? So the first thing that we need to understand if we try to, to have a sense of how to manage this problem is, is its complexity and the assumptions that go behind uh, delivering an appropriate fire safety strategy that enables us to give the best protection to these particular buildings. So uh, this diagram looks very complicated, but it's actually not as complicated, but it does have some key components that we need to address. Uh, the first one is that fire is quite unique because it is a phenomena that evolves in space and time and that affects the well-being of people and property. Most hazards do not evolve in space and time. Both, most hazards are loads that are applied you know, to a building. And, uh, and those loads are predetermined. So when you have an earthquake, you cannot alter the course of the earthquake. When you have a flood, you cannot alter the course of the flood and the same thing with wind and other hazards. With fire, the decisions that we make, both in the design and management process are going to completely transform the outcome of a fire. So if we design the building properly and we make the right decisions, the fire will be an inconsequential event. And this is what we aim uh, when we design a fire safety strategy. Now, if we make mistakes, both in the design and maintenance, then what we get is extraordinary, potentially extraordinary consequences. Now, to be able to understand how we manage this fire safety strategy, it's important to understand how we do it and what are the key assumptions. So for example, if you look at, oops, sorry. If you look at, at ignition, uh, one of the assumptions that we make is that a fire will always happen. In the lifetime of a building, there will be fires. In other words, there will always be a fire that gets started. Now, obviously a fire that gets started if it's managed appropriately is inconsequential. That is the case of the burning frying pan or the toast where you have a smoke detector and the smoke detector gives you a rapid alarm, you know something is burning, you turn off the toaster and the toaster has all the protective provisions that it prevents, for example, a short circuit because there's fuses involved and so forth. So most of the fires are completely intranscendental. Nevertheless, the probability of having a fire uh, in, 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 a, in the lifetime of a building is so high that we have to assume is going to happen. In other words, the first assumption that we make is that the probability of a fire is one. Okay, the second assumption that we make 
is that when we design buildings, we assume fires are accidental. So we don't design for voluntary fires. Arson is something that we define as a crime, and therefore we use the legal tool to actually deter people from doing arson. We don't design buildings uh, to behave appropriately when we have voluntary fires, because managing the potential of, volunta of voluntary fires is extraordinarily complex and costly, and therefore it is, it is nothing that we actually have to or want to do in the design process. So, so multiple fires are generally excluded from the design process. We might decide to include levels of robustness, but in essence, we uh, ignore the voluntary fire and we focus on accidental fires and we accept that they can be natural or human. Now, where is, what is the role of fire protection? So the role of fire protection is to manage the growth so that we get acceptable losses. And, uh, and uh, sorry about that. So when we get acceptable losses, the real question is what does that mean? Now, society deems that the key objective of fire safety is life safety. So the focus of most provisions that we put on fire safety are there to try to avoid casualties or injury of occupants or the fire service. So if you think of Notre Dame from the perspective of the societal responsibility towards fire safety, Notre Dame could actually be treated as a success. And the reason why it can be treated as a success, it is because there were no casualties and there were no major injuries. So in essence, the objective of our entire regulatory structure is to guarantee the safety of people. It is life safety. Property protection is considered you know, to be something that is mostly relevant to insurance companies and so forth. And therefore it is not considered a prime line of protection. So when you're talking about cultural heritage and the value associated to cultural heritage, the first thing that we need to recognize is that our codes and our professional practice will not grant a value to the building unless that is decided explicitly by the stakeholders that are involved in the protection of the building. The application of our regulatory framework will be focused mostly on life safety and it will not put any focus on the protection of the property itself. Additional provisions will have to be introduced to guarantee uh, a level of protection for the property that is commensurate to historical and heritage value. So if we understand that we accept that a fire is gonna happen and therefore we need fire safety provisions, that we will deem it to be an accidental fire, which basically means there's only going to be one fire and that our focus is life safety, then we start understanding why we tend to have so many problems when it comes to heritage buildings. Because in principle, a lot of these buildings are designed in a certain way that effectively result in probably uh, an adequate protection of the people, but the potential entire loss of the property itself. So now how do we um, solve the problem? If we want to go to first principles, we treat the problem uh, on the basis of what we call a fire safety strategy. Now that diagram looks extremely complicated, but all that that diagram shows you is how we introduce different forms of protection like detection, sprinklers, fire service and so forth to try to manage the fire. And the black line represents the growth of the fire in such a way that we can control, reduce, modulate the evolution of the fire so that we can get people out on time. So what is labeled as TE is the time to evacuation. And the time to evacuation has to be much, much smaller than the time for the fire to reach conditions that are inappropriate for people. Now, we normally try to avoid structural collapse. So there's a TS, which is a structural collapse. And we normally expect that the time to evacuation is much, much smaller 
than the time for structural collapse. But we don't like structural collapse, particularly not in cities. And therefore, uh, we normally aim to have uh, structural failure never happen. In other words, the building should withstand burnout. So the concept of a fire safety strategy is what an engineer does to try to put all the tools that they have available to try to achieve those target objectives, which are mostly uh, concerned with uh, life safety, and therefore they're all focused in this evacuation time of this TE, and everything else becomes secondary. Now, because fire evolves in space and time, then everything has to be put in a timeline. And what you see in that diagram is a timeline. And you have to make sure that your evacuation times then fall somewhere in that timeline in a manner such that guarantee that the safety of the people is preserved. Okay, so in a way that is the job of a fire engineer. Now, where does the confusion come in? You know, when, uh, when we're talking about heritage buildings, the confusion comes in when we're talking about compliance. Now, compliance is a very complex process. And most people, when they manage a building, they're going to seek whether it is from the fire service, a building certifier, or an engineer, they're going to seek being compliant. Now, compliant for a modern building uh, can be a very straightforward process if we have uh, a problem that repeats itself very regularly, that we have already studied, that we have analyzed to exhaustion, and we know what the solution is. Because when we know that, and we have already done this solution, and we have already tested it, then we can create a solution that is like a recipe, and that is the code. So the code basically in the UK is not really a code, but it is a set of guidance. And that guidance basically tells me the solution to a problem that I already know. Now, because I have to know the problem, I have to be able to classify it. In other words, the classification are all the buildings that resemble the solution that I have already tested and demonstrated that is appropriate. So in essence, to be able to apply a code-based solution or a guidance-based solution, the first thing you do is you classify the building. Now you know is this type of building is a residential building. Okay. Now, once you have classified the building, you understand its performance. And because you understand its performance, then you can put a simple set of rules that deliver a solution that a building certifier can actually determine that is compliant. In other words, they will check if you fulfill all the requirements of the code and establish that it is compliant. Now, the problem with heritage is that heritage cannot be classified. Every heritage building is unique. It brings not only unique risks, like Notre Dame's roof, for example, but it also brings unique advantages. So for example, most historic buildings, because of their architecture, they have very large volumes. Modern buildings have much shorter volumes, much smaller volumes. Now, a big volume allows to dissipate the smoke and therefore gives a lot of time for intervention. So older buildings, for example, have virtues. And one of the virtues is that we have a much longer intervention time. In modern buildings, we have lower ceilings and therefore we have a much shorter intervention time. On the other hand, for example, Historical buildings tend to be made out of traditional materials, and many times those traditional materials bring uh, extended risks that modern buildings potentially don't have. So in essence, you can never treat a, a historic building or a heritage building as an older version of the new building. So trying to make a, a heritage building compliant is a fundamental misunderstanding of the complexity of the problem because it will never be compliant in the sense that it can never be classified. And therefore the solution cannot be the standardized solution and therefore it cannot be compliant. The building needs to be analyzed for its performance and you have to define that performance in an explicit way. 
if you don't define it in an explicit way and show what are the weaknesses and the virtues of that specific building, and you just simply anchor it to an existing set of guidance or an existing classification, then you're completely misunderstanding the complexity of the problem. So now this is something that we have learned, you know, through centuries and, uh, and you know, fires like the Great Fire of London taught us a number of lessons. So we learned from the Great Fire of London, you know, the problem of using combustible materials, you know, uh, timber. Uh, we learned from the Great Fire of London, the problem of having buildings being too close to each other and uh, because a fire can jump from one building to another. And all those lessons were le learned and they were embedded in an urban planning. So we try to modify the way in which we build things to try to prevent these massive conflagrations. Now, we were quite successful for a while until the Industrial Revolution. Now, in the Industrial Revolution, what we did is we densified the cities so much that again, we run into a, a situation in which uh, we created a problem that resulted in an urban conflagration. But it was at this period that we actually managed to understand sufficiently the problem to be able to create urban planning rules that change completely the game. So before we were fighting against the urban conflagration, the fires moving from one building to the next one and creating these enormous fires. Now, James Braywood was uh, the first really professional firefighter. Uh, he wrote the, this book, Construction of Fire Engines, Apparatus and the Training of Firemen. And it's a book that is still utilized by the fire brigades today. Now, he was uh, the son of a builder and therefore had a real deep understanding of, uh, of construction. And, uh, and he analyzed uh, how to change the way in which we do urban planning to try to eliminate the risk of an urban conflagration. Now, unfortunately, uh, doing his firefighter duties in London, uh, James Braywood died in the Tooley Street Fire, which is probably one of the last urban conflagrations to happen uh, in, in London. Now, what was the conclusion of this period? The conclusion of this period was effectively what we call separation distance and the non-combustibility of external um, construction materials. So we required, as part of urban planning, we required buildings to be separated by a minimum distance that prevented a fire from jump to jump from one building to another. So, and we, uh, we guaranteed that the external materials in buildings were actually uh, all made of non-combustible materials and therefore uh, we eliminated completely the possibility of a fire in one building moving into the adjacent buildings and therefore creating the potential for an urban conflagration. Now interestingly enough that completely transformed the problem because it turned the problem from an urban problem where you required massive resources to fight that problem, it turned it into a local building problem. So all of a sudden, what we had was building regulations and they were focused on literally guaranteeing the life safety of people within the context of one building. And the fact that we had these very simple rules of separations and non-combustibility allowed us to eliminate completely the problem of the urban conflagration. And uh, the problem became much more tractable, which effectively transformed the fire brigades because the fire brigades now were designed to fight a building fire and not an urban fire. And it transformed insurance companies, it transformed all sorts of things and basically created a problem that was so much more tractable that effectively allowed us uh, you know, to manage it in a way such that fire losses are in most cases negligible compared to most other hazards. So how did we know that we got it right? So uh, basically Paris is the response because Paris was going fundamentally in the same direction as London. Its population had exploded uh, in, during the industrial revolution. And, uh, and, and it was a city that had all sorts of problems. Now, 
Emperor Napoleon III, looking into this, uh, was wondering why Paris was not more like London, you know, with the great parks and gardens, tree-lined avenues, and modern sewage systems. So there was a there was a real interest in trying to modify uh, the way Paris uh, was, which, you know, brought uh, uh, Baron Haussmann uh, to develop one of the most extensive public works program ever to be carried in a European city. So Paris was completely transformed. Many buildings were knocked down. And there was an enforcement of building separation that was actually borrowed from London. And the requirement of non-combustible facades was also borrowed from London. As a result, you know, post houseman Paris never burned. As opposed to Chicago, San Francisco, and uh, many other cities around the world, Paris had never had uh, an urban conflagration uh, of, of that nature. So in essence, you know, we had a set of rules that actually allowed us by means of urban planning to get to where we wanted. Now, then, you know, we have the building problem. And now we have to start looking at the way in which we address the building problem. And people studied fire in a very careful way to try to understand how to address the different problems. And for example, the introduction of new technologies uh, started creating new hazards and we start studying those new hazards to try to solve those problems now what you see there is a, is a photograph of of a fire that happened in the united states uh the the beam that crosses the 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 photograph is a timber beam and the beams that are hanging from the timber beam are steel beams and as you can see the modern method of construction is a lot weaker than the old method of construction. So timber uh, behaved much, much better than steel. And therefore there was a need or a will to try to find a way by which we could actually make steel perform as good as timber. Now that resulted in the concept of fire resistance. Fire resistance was, was developed by an individual called Imberg in the 1920s and basically created a concept by which uh, we had a method of testing that enables us to understand how we insulate steel in such a way that it can perform as well as timber. Now, why am I highlighting this particular example? Because I want to show an example in which new meant worse. The use of, timber, of steel created a problem. So modern construction, the, the evolution of the construction techniques ended up creating a problem that didn't exist before. Now, the moment that that problem, which was the early collapse of buildings appeared, then we introduced a technology or an approach towards performance assessment that allowed us to fix the problem. Now, if our building was entirely of timber, we will not have the problem. So theoretically speaking, that building would be better made out of timber than it was made out of steel. Now, the problem being fixed and fire resistance incorporated into the steel structure potentially made the steel structure equal or better than the timber structure. But as you can see, they're two completely different problems. And they have to be addressed in a completely different way because the problem of timber is combustibility and it is not necessarily its structural failure. While the problem of steel is a structural failure at a much earlier time than what a timber beam that is charring would actually fail. So modern doesn't mean better, it just means different. Modern methods do not necessarily apply to older techniques of construction. So utilizing the concept of fire resistance to try to address a timber structure is a mistake because it is a concept that was actually designed for non-combustible structures like steel, okay? So we need to keep that in mind because it's a very, very important concept. Now here is uh, the way in which this test was devised. So if you look at the photograph to the right, that's the old way. So they were throwing uh, timber into a furnace 
creating a big fire that was described by this temperature versus time curve that I can show them showing on the left bottom corner. And what you see on the top is a furnace, a modern furnace that is used for this uh, fire resistance uh, testing. Now, as I said, that method of testing was devised to try to protect steel so that it guaranteed a certain structural integrity. It was never designed to be used with timber or with historical structures. So requiring fire resistance from a historical structure is by definition an inappropriate approach towards determining performance. So in, in essence, a heritage building is not an old version of a modern building. Now, I like using Hagia Sophia because Hagia Sophia is a building that was designed in a way such that no matter how big a fire you make, the, uh, the, the way in which air is being handled in that building will always prevent it from any form of structural failure. So I would never have to be concerned about having a structural failure in Ayasofia because Ayasofia has the capacity to entrain air in a way such that as the hot smoke goes up, it cools off so much that it can actually not um, destroy any of the combustible features of uh, the, the basilica. So in essence, this is a building that through the years uh, has seen many, many fires and none of those fires have ever created a situation by which the structural integrity of that building was compromised. So older does not, does not mean less safe, does not comply with codes does not mean it's unsafe. As you can see through the years, technologies have changed, spaces have changed, layouts have changed, and we need to treat them in a way such that actually recognizes the complexity of what we're doing. And in the case of heritage, recognizes the value of the building and, it, and its contents, and it is not directed purely to the support of life safety. So prescriptive requirements establish current safety requirements, ident identify prescriptive problems, identify the quantitative intent of regulations, and you have to identify the potential conflicts with other objectives. What do I mean by that? So in essence, compliance has to be redefined. Compliance has to be redefined as delivering the intent of the code, not delivering the details or the solution that the code provides, which is defined for an, a modern classification. And also it requires identify other conflicts with other objectives. Now in modern construction, the objectives might be sustainability. Now in heritage buildings, the objectives might be preserving a door, might be invaluable artwork, might be an extraordinary unique construction methodology that needs to be retained might be detailing of the building that is extremely important. So we need to be very careful in the way in which we address conflict with other objectives. This is a, a typical problem is the trivial solution of trying to put sprinklers in all buildings results in a massive conflict, for example, with the heritage value of the building. This is a perfect example uh, of creating a problem that actually uh, doesn't really exist. So this is a building in Geneva, it's the Bastion's building of the University of Geneva. And it was undergoing a refurbishment uh, to upgrade the fire safety provisions. Now, this is a classic uh, heritage building. It has all sorts of unique features. It has extraordinary artwork. It has extraordinary uh, detailing. It has enormous volumes that allow for extraordinarily long uh, travel distances. Uh, and the structure in itself is, is made uh, in a certain way that this building had suffered multiple fires and actually never really resulted in any major damage. Now, the attempt of making this building compliant resulted that everything that you see in red was either a change or an addition to the building. Now, the most extraordinarily negative addition was the addition of the two, apologies, the addition of the two means of egress. So you can see one on the left, you can see one on the right. And these are external staircases 
that were added to comply with the required travel distances. Now, the required travel distances in this case are completely unnecessary because the volumes are so big that you can extend those travel distances enormously. And, and they are being placed in a location where nobody is going to utilize them. So you're adding this extraordinarily intrusive set of metallic stairs to a building, uh, altering its historical value for absolutely no gain other than just argue that it is compliant with a code that was never built or designed for the purpose of addressing the performance of a building of this nature. Now, this gets so horrific uh, that to be able to guarantee the, the required compartmentation by code, certain of the major arches of the corridors had to be compartmentalized and to, in principle, not alter the aesthetic, the interior aesthetic of the building, the decision was made to make those doors invisible. In other words, you're covering them with mirrors in such a way that when you look at it from the side, the doors almost disappear into the building so you cannot see them. Now, you would imagine that, uh, that when you put a person, and that's me, uh, uh, and uh, you, can, you can see the reflection and you can see the reality of what you just did. But if that person is actually evacuated in an emergency, you know, what you're going to get is that that door is going to close and the door is going to close to guarantee the compartmentation. Now, the question to me is if the door has a mirror and that mirror makes it invisible, what you get is whether it is open and you get the, the regular circulation, people keep banging themselves against the door. And in the case of an emergency where the door closes to compartmentalize the corridor, people trying to get out through that building, again, will end up banging themselves against the door. So this is a very good example of how extreme we can try to comply with something that we don't have to comply with. And at the same time, how much by trivializing the solution and dealing with it in a way that is just simply going back to the guidance or to the code is preventing those people doing the design from actually thinking. So this is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and very happy to answer any questions. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see uh, the, the questions that you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. That was absolutely fascinating and very clearly explained. And in this last case study, I couldn't resist laughing, even though when I think about it, it's actually quite sad. I am sure there are going to be many questions. Um, please feel free to write them in the Q&A. The number of attendants has been raising during your talk. So for those of you who were not here at the beginning, just type the questions in the Q&A. I will read them to Jose. He can also see them. And if if possible and applicable, mention which institution you belong to. While I give some time to everyone to type their questions, I'll start with one of my own. I, I was really intrigued by the design of the Hagia Sophia that you presented. Um, one of my academic interests is the simulation of historic airflows using CFD. So I, I wonder whether you could give us any more detail on how it operates and, and the meaning of these arrows that your picture was showing. Yeah, so basically when you, when you have a fire, obviously buoyancy dominates and brings the smoke up. So the when fires um, will entrain a lot of air into the smoke, cooling it down. So yeah, we did a CFD model of, uh, of Ayasofia, actually multiple CFD models of Ayasofia. And, uh, and the interesting thing about Hagia Sophia is the way in which ventilation happens, because effectively you get an enormous amount of air coming in from the bottom, which effectively ends up cooling the smoke very rapidly. Now, as the smoke go, goes up, uh, it actually stratifies and it has a mo multiple weak points like openings where it can actually uh, come out. So when you start increasing the size of the fire, you realize that you have to go to an extraordinary large fire 
that you will never have that level of combustibles in, in, in the ground. An extraordinarily large fire before you get to a condition in which the temperatures can actually ignite any combustible materials you know, up, up, up in the structure or affect the structural integrity. Now, one of the things that people don't recognize is that uh, in a fire only damages the structure once it transitions from a fire that is a contained fire that is actually burning in one place and entraining air and producing smoke that because it entrains air has very low temperature. When it transitions, the phenomena that we call flashover and it becomes burns everything, the change in temperatures is very drastic. And then you go from temperatures of 60 to 80 degrees, which are not harmful to a structure, to temperatures of 1,000 degrees, which are very harmful to the structure and will ignite any combustible material. Now, so Biosophia is one of those buildings that because of its geometry, it will never transition to flashover. So the smoke will always be cold. And, uh, and if you do the CFD, you realize very rapidly that you're very far away from it. And, uh, and the type of fire that you will have to have is so large that it will never happen. You will have to fill the church about a third of it full of combustibles, you know, in height. Uh, would it be a stretch to, to say that there are lessons to be learned from the way historical buildings are constructed or engineered to prevent fires? Oh, absolutely, because a, a lot of these buildings that actually have survived is because people intuitively yeah. did certain things, you know, to address the problem of fire. They might have not understood uh, what exactly they were doing, but they had observed it. So they made certain decisions, and the typical one is increasing the floor to ceiling height. So, so that is a provision that if you look into 17th century French architecture, it enters 17th century French architecture as a provision uh, you know, for fire safety because people recognize that if you made the ceiling above a certain height, you will not get flash over. So you get fires that actually never grow. And, uh, and, and they, there are certain provisions that enter the not building regulations, but the building traditions in France mm -hmm. in, the, in the 17th century that, uh, that recommended certain floor to ceiling heights and, and of course, you know, we have migrated into modern architecture and we try to optimize now the floor to ceiling height to the minimum possible so that we can stick as many floors as possible without increasing the height. And that forces us to put other provisions to compensate, which is the same thing of the insulation with steel. You put provisions to compensate for the decisions that you make that in the past you were, would not have done for reasons associated with fire safety. Okay, there's a question. Perfect. I'll, I'll read it aloud for the benefit of all the public. The question says, how can concerns about compliance be mitigated and addressed specifically in reference to new regulations relating to fire door compliance and the new liability of responsible building managers to have certified 30 minute doors to floods, quite probably resulting in the loss of many historic doors in older buildings? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that people need to understand is that the United Kingdom does not have codes. The United Kingdom has guidance. We, have, we operate under a system of functional requirements. And because there are functional requirements where they're to demonstrate a certain performance. Now, one way of demonstrating performance is by means of using guidance. But if you actually appoint a proper fire engineer to do the job, there's absolutely no reason why you have to keep those 30 minute doors. You can actually uh, demonstrate that you can achieve the same objective you know, without those doors. And that the example that I gave of, um, of the Bastions building in Geneva, with those floor to ceiling heights, for example, I managed to retain all the, the original doors because those corridors and those rooms will never attain flush over. And therefore there was no need for a 30 minute requirement because the, the doors will never ignite. And um, so in essence, uh, there is no such a thing as compliance in the UK. Compliance in the UK is the agreement of two parties. 
So if you create a proper analysis that is properly justified and properly explained, then the authority uh, will have the responsibility to be able to assess it and establish if it is appropriate. Now, this has always been a problem because there's always been a, uh, an imbalance of competency in the UK where the building certifiers have, have such low level of competency that they were very conservative because they will not be willing to certify a building uh, that they could not understand. So if the strategy was such that it was too complicated for them to understand, uh, that uh, they would have stopped it. Now, government, the government has created, uh, you know, together with this concept of liability for the responsible building managers, it has created uh, the building safety regulator. So now that sits within the health and safety executive, and that is supposed to be a quality control for building certifiers. So in principle, it is the building safety regulator that is deemed to have the competency to be able to adjudicate it when there is a conflict between the designer and the building certifier. So the final word now sits with the building safety regulator, which sits inside the health and safety executive, and therefore the expectation is that that individual will have sufficient level of competency to understand an intelligent performance-based analysis that is consistent with the functional requirements building regulations. I hope I answered the question. Any other question for Jose? Okay, I think there is, there doesn't seem to be any further questions. If not, I, I can take full advantage of the situation to take, ask another question I'm very curious about. Um, as, as, as you know, Jose, I, I study the gradual degradation of heritage. So on the other end of the spectrum of the damage that you study, the degradation that happens over many years, for example, as a cause of high humidity and so on that affects organic materials. And I'm wondering whether there's an intersection between the application of fire codes or the uh, unwitty application of fire codes, as you have described, that could potentially accelerate gradual degradation. For example, compartmentalization that may alter the way a building ventilates and therefore lead to risks of, I don't know, pests or mold and things like that. Have you ever encountered the, the, this sort of interaction? Oh yeah, this is very common. I mean, I think mm -hmm. uh, you know attempts uh, you know to compartmentalize roof spaces have created all sorts of problems with timber structures. Uh, there, there's been many many cases where the the excessive insulation uh, of walls, for example, have created condition internal conditions uh, that have resulted in degradation. Of, uh, of, of many historical, um, very valuable historical elements of the building. And uh, I mean, the, the unscrupulous intervention uh, is extremely common and, uh, and it is very sad that it's always justified, you know, with this concept that you have to be compliant. And uh, when it's completely unnecessary, we don't really have to go through that path. But it's, it's a very, you know, oversimplistic approach. But but yeah, it's it's actually very very common. I mean, the the amount of problems that fire safety creates in heritage buildings is extraordinary. Very interesting. Um, well, thank you, Jose. And I, I think if there are no more questions, we could leave it here. Even though I would be happy to continue myself. Oh, there's some, there's one the, a couple that just came in. Right, let's let's take this to them. Uh, let's see if we can in the next four minutes. So Kevin asks, um, he's an engineer from Heritage Malta. If you compartmentalize an area, do you create a new hazard from containing a blaze, and then the elevated temperature becomes dangerous since it creates new issues of structural stability if the building is built by a limestone rock which you have a lot of in Malta. What temperatures, temperatures are we looking at? Yeah, I mean, this is perfectly possible. So, so effectively, if you, if you keep the massive volume, 
and that massive volume prevents you from progressing to flash over, the problem would have been solved itself naturally. So sometimes when you compartmentalize the, the building according to modern building regulations, then you create smaller compartments and those smaller compartments are much more susceptible you know, to flash over. And then you have very, very high temperatures that are not only going to affect the rock, but most likely will affect negatively the many of these historical buildings have uh, timber roofs, uh, sorry, timber floors. And uh, so will affect the timber floors. And, uh, and if the timber is exposed, it will ignite the timber and, uh, and create all sorts of other problems. Uh, so yeah, so poorly thought compartmentalization can be very detrimental you know, to the building. Now, this is very, very common on roof spaces. Uh, you know, people try to compartmentalize roof spaces thinking that that reduces the hazard. But potentially, depending on the type of roof and, 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 what, and, and, and the, the, the particular building, uh, compartmentalizing those roofs can actually have a very detrimental effect. So you need to understand the fire dynamics and create a space that actually minimizes the hazard, as opposed to blindly saying compartmentalizing the fire is good, and uh, you know which is really uh, you know where the, the 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 problem sits. Thanks, and we'll end with a question from Katie Hawks, who asks quite simply: Should we be slathering our heritage woodwork with intermescent chemicals? Uh, that is a an excellent question because again. There's no yes or no answer. This is a very complicated problem. Uh, you know, fire retardants and intermescent chemicals uh, effectively have a role, and that role is to delay ignition. So what they do is they increase the ignition temperature in a way such that you have delayed ignition. Okay. So if the conditions are such that gaining a few degrees of delay of ignition would change completely the outcome, then the, the coating becomes necessary. But if the condition is such that ignition will always happen, for example, or will never happen, then there's absolutely no point in putting you know, this coating. So the first thing that you need to establish is what are going to be the potential conditions in the compartment, and then see if preventing ignition is something that actually makes any difference to the outcome. Once you make that decision, then you can decide whether you use the coating or not. Now, my experience is that in 99% of the cases, it makes no difference at all. And those coatings are being marketed and, you know, and they of course have an effect, but that effect is not necessarily meaningful for the fire safety strategy. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jose. I'm sure we could go on, but we've taken enough of your time. That's been absolutely fascinating. And thanks for your answers to these specific problems. Um, your video, as we said, will be available online. And er for everyone else, I hope I will see you in next month's lecture, which for the first time since pre-COVID times, it's going to be in person and followed by a wine reception in UCL. So I hope I'll be seeing you there. Thanks hopefully, again. Hopefully next time you invite me, it's going to be in person and I will get some <laughs> wine. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.